God bless you for being here this morning. Praise God. We received that blessing. We have it. Somebody say, I have it. Glory to God. Glory to God. You do. Thank you, Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. We're going to be moving in quite a bit, three or four places, five maybe. Won't be hanging around too long on any one spot. Appreciate the privilege we have to be in the house of the Lord today. Glad for each of you. May the Lord richly bless you. Participate in giving the Lord thanks. Participate in worshiping Him. Participate in serving Him. Be a light to those around you. Amen. It's beneficial. You'll not regret it. Ask the Lord to forgive you when you failed. And if you're honest with God, you'll be asking Him frequently. Not that we're ugly, not that we have to, but it happens. Ask the Lord to forgive you when you know you failed. Not talking about some uh, uh, sinister lie or some big thing like that, of course of that. But the times each day that we uh, lack our relationship, lack our praise and thanksgiving, lack in prayer life and study and so forth, ask the Lord to forgive you and to give you strength. And you'll have that sooner or later. It'll come to you. And you'll be pleased to have the challenge as to whether to pray or not. You'll be pleased at the challenge of, do I study now or, or later? And you want to jump in studying because you've asked him to help you previously. He'll help you. Amen. Let's ask the Lord to bless today. Father, thank you so much for this privilege we have to be in your house once again and gathered with this people. For the joy and victory that we have in Christ, our Lord of life abundant and eternal. Thank you, Lord, for deliverance and peace and joy and victory and promises and blessings that we experience on a regular basis and for the privilege to serve you in this hour. We're asking that your grace and mercy and love continue to be effectual in our lives. Father, would you guide my thoughts and words today as I present your word that we're all prepared to hear truth and are willing and able and decisive to follow your truth in the ways of righteousness to serve and honor you, glorify you even in the hour that we're living in. Thank you, Father, for the benefit that we have, for the privilege that we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to talk about Noah just for a little bit, but not very long. <clears throat> we know uh, Noah's call that uh, God told him to build an ark. Certain materials, certain descriptions, certain size, what to do about it. And he preached for a long time, and it didn't seem to do a whole lot of good. So God says, build an ark. So he did, and it came time for the rain to come and the flood to come. Noah was well up into years, 600, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And they all got on the boat, he and his wife his sons and their, his wives, their wives, and all the animals that he got on the ark. And there they were while the earth was covered with water for over a year. Now what we're going to read is when this all subsided. Chapter 8, verse 18. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. They went off the boat. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds, went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. Say the Lord smelled. Say a sweet savor. Now, after all of this commotion that's happened for over a year prior to this, the, the flood had subsided. All the folks on the boat got off. The first thing Noah did, he made sacrifice, made an offering unto the Lord in the manner that he was taught and brought up to do. And the first response, the Lord smelled something that smelled awfully good. 
Anytime anybody ever says, let's give the Lord praise and thanksgiving, the Lord is smelling something that smells wonderful to Him. Now this is in, involved with animals and burning and, and so forth and so on, and we understand when meat is being cooked, it smells good or bread or anything like that. We understand the concept. But what Noah is doing here, though it literally was going on, what Noah was doing is offering praise and thanksgiving. And in the manner that he was doing it, after everything had, had happened, it smelled good to the Lord. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. That concept and that verse will continue on forever and ever. But the point of this message this morning is God smelled a sweet-smelling savor, something that was pleasing and acceptable unto God. He called it a sweet-smelling savor because it pleased Him. It was something enjoyable, inviting, and welcoming. Amen. Turn with me, please, to Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1. Now, if you know anything about Leviticus and a couple of the books, they entail a lot of details. The priesthood, how they ministered, all the de meticulous details of all the things that they've done in the process of honoring the Lord, recognizing the Lord with respect, and so forth and so on. I'm just going to look at a little bitty portion here in the first chapter of Leviticus, verse 1. And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish, he shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make an atonement for him. Something about acknowledging God, offering him sacrifice of praise, is atoning to us or for us. Now we understand about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ out of being an atonement for us. I understand that. But the point is here, what the process was, getting a, an animal, and there's several things that they were involved in, goat, sheep, bullock, pigeon, turtle doves, cakes, first fruit from the cops, various things that they used to bring to bring sacrifice unto the Lord in that process of doing it, in the way that they were supposed to. Let me change uh, the vernacular a little bit, doing what we're doing in the manner of the right motivation from the heart. This was all physical. They were following rules and regulations, meticulous details and so forth, which was the plan at the time. What I'm talking about today is pleasing God with something that smells good to Him. From the motivation of our heart that's as motivated by love and grace and, and all those things that God would have us to be motivated by, Anybody ever being motivated by something selfish? Well, yeah, it's happened before, hasn't it? Let's stop that and not allow that anymore from this day forward. Praise God, serve Him, and honor Him in the motivation of God's love and purpose, that He receives honor and glory and the benefit that He promises to come our way. It says a voluntary offering. Bring whatever it is that you have. Well, what do I have? You have yourself. You have what you believe. You have what your motivation. You have what your purpose is and what God has called you into. You have that to offer unto the Lord. And he's expelling, expecting something that smells good. Amen. <laughs> Ever get anything out of the refrigerator and open it up and it didn't smell good? Yes. If this happened twice, one time because I didn't know it. Well, actually, I didn't know it both times. But anyway... Both times we had meat in a freezer. 
electricity went out, got unplugged or turned off or whatever. Time went by, went and opened it up, Brother Mitch. Nearly fell back, literally. That happened twice, and I thought, oh, I'm going to try my best not to allow this to happen again, and so forth it happened. The last time was back in 2007 when the thieves came and turned things off, and I didn't realize that they did it. That's a good while back, wasn't it? Thank the Lord I hadn't experienced that in a long time. Amen. Okay, the point is God wants to smell something that smells good. Amen. Went by Curtis's last night. I smelled something smelled really good. Amen. Got up to some homemade soup the other day. It was real good. I enjoy, isn't it marvelous that our nose works good and you smell things that's good? Amen. Noah's wondering what I'm going to say next because he's smiling. There's some things that don't smell so good. All right, we'll get off of that, Lord. Turn with me, please, to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Now, we know the story of Daniel, at least to some extent. His beginning, how that he come under Nebuchadnezzar, he and the three other boys, was kind of prisoners, so to speak. Things weren't going so well until they were enlightened of their capabilities. And King Nebuchadnezzar uh, had a dream. We're going to be in chapter 2 of Daniel. He had a dream, and the dream was about this big image. Anybody remember that? It was an image. And the image had a head of gold. It had arms of silver. Uh, let's see, what else was it? Uh, and of brass and of iron and clay and so forth. He saw this image and it shook him up somewhat and he couldn't get anybody that he thought he could trust in to tell him what it meant. So he found out about Daniel's ability and called Daniel in and he told him what it was. This was moving Nebuchadnezzar in a big way. He wanted help real quick. Notice here starting in verse 44. And in the days of these kings, this is the interpretation of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. It's talking about something in prophecy that has yet to come about yet. It's talking about kingdoms. It's talking about the Antichrist. It's talking about the future kingdom of God Almighty. Anyway, it starts in verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to one another, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Doesn't that sound great? I'm so looking forward to that time. I am, I am, I am. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter and the interpretation thereof sure then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and worshiped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation or sacrifice and a sweet odors unto him of course, his devotion was skewed, but his motivation was in right place. He wanted to offer op, uh, 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 an offering. He wanted to offer something to show uh, uh, praise and thanksgiving and something that will be pleasing. Amen. One of the most pleasing smells I am, are, am blessed with and I look forward to every time I fire up the grill. That smells pretty good just by itself. <laughs> then I get the chicken out there or the pork chops, or whatever, and close the lid to where it's almost closed, and it starts smoking in there, and I go back in and tend to whatever and come back out, and just as I open the door and start walking outside, Brother Jeremy, oh, I smell that, and I'm first thought, my first thought, I wonder if the neighbors are smelling this. This smells good. I hope they smell it. Hope they want to get out and cook something too. I enjoy that. We're talking about a sweet-smelling savor unto God Almighty that he would enjoy and that he would accept. Uh, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods, a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing that thou couldst reveal this secret. Then the king uh, made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, a chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king that he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Blessing followed. 
that which we do, that a believer does, that brings honor and glory to God. Blessing will follow in one form or the other. And by the way, I'm going to back up and say something I meant to say before I got started. I'm not opposed to numbers. Let however many come here, come here as they want. That's not my main motivation. My main motivation is to pastor, to teach, to care for the ones that are here. Amen. If we fill up and have to double the size of this building, great. Y'all get involved in that and do that. Louise and I will pastor by God's grace and help. <laughs> Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. Now we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty just for a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, a sweet-smelling savor. Verse 14, Paul says this to this church, Now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. You know, this is what the Lord provides for us, a cause. He causes us to triumph. Triumph means to win, to overcome, to stand unscathed by the enemy. Is that possible? Yeah. Oh, there's no use of the shield of faith. Amen. Thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. I left you all on soak cycle. And maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. I'm going to read that second half again. And makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet smelling, or sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. This will explain itself in a moment. We are a sweet smelling savor unto God Almighty. Who we are and what we're all about is pleasurable unto him, delightful unto him. He's disappointed etc. when we disobey. He's disappointed, etc. when we ha are heady and high-minded and proud and all those kind of ugly things. Do we have the capacity of being that way? Yeah. Does God have the capacity to be angry? Yeah. Is he going to be our... <clears throat> yes, we know that. Either our blesser or our condemner. He's righteous and holy, and he'll not draw back from that. God is so interested in our life being something that smells good. How does our life smell to Him? Amen. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in that are perished. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other savor of life unto death. And who is sufficient for these things? Who in the world can, can provide life in the gospel of Jesus Christ other than through God, through Jesus Christ, through the apostles, through the ministry of the, of the church? No one else. There's only one name given among men under heaven which why we can be saved. There's only one way. There's only one way that we can please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Our status, our relationship, our being is established on hope. It's established on faith. It's established on believing what His promise is concerning salvation. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as some sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Blessed be the Lamb of God for His loving kindness and mercy towards us, for the hope and joy and victory that we have in Him. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Back when Noah was involved, the priest in Leviticus was involved, and everybody else was involved. It was pleasing to God when that was going on that he recognized that it was a sweet smell to him. Notice what this verse says. And hath given himself 
for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Do you know there was a sacrifice a little over 200 year, 2,000 years ago that pleased him as ugly as it was and how skewed it, as it was? God provided and he gave his only son as a sacrifice for us. When that happened, when that occasion was established, it was a wonderful, glorious, pleasing thing to God. Amen. Amen. Let me help you understand that just a little bit, and this may be a poor way of doing it, but it'll help us. How many have ever procrastinated and finally got around to doing what you were procrastinating about and finally got it finished that you felt so much better? It was pleasing to you. You was happy about it, and you didn't understand why in the world you wait around so long. Amen. This is a poor way of explaining it, but Jesus Christ was given a sacrifice. It pleased God to get this done. Look how much time had passed along. Now, I'm not trying to say that God procrastinated. I'm just saying it came a point in time where Jesus Christ was offered. He came and done what he did. Jesus Christ died, was buried, and raised again the third day. God was pleased. This is a good thing. Amen. A sweet-smelling savor. Goes on to say, uh, no, that's it, verse 1 and 2. For us an offering a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Be followers of Christ. Walk in love. Please Him. Honor Him. I mentioned that verse in Hebrews chapter 11. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So we must walk in faith. We must walk in love. We must live in a manner that pleases Him. No, our goal isn't to be a goody two-shoes, though that's the name some may give you. Our goal is to honor Him and serve Him, follow His direction, follow His guideline, follow His purpose, fulfill His plan in your life so that it would be pleasing to Him, acceptable to Him, something that smells wonderful. Amen. Philippians 4.18 says, An odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Colossians 1 and 10 says this, Walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Last verse, 1 John. 322. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Amen. Let the word of God dwell richly in you. Let the spirit of God move you concerning what's pleasing God, what's not pleasing him. And we already know those things most of the time pretty quickly. There was things that people in the Old Testament followed to bring honor and glory to God that pleased Him. That wasn't sufficient to get rid of sin, but something was done that was sufficient, that really pleased God, that gets rid of sin in our life. Every one of us was once bound in the bondage of sin with no hope. But when that sacrifice came and it was done and it was established, it was pleasing unto God. Not that God is cruel, not that he's a jerk, nothing like that at all. But finally, a covenant, an established truth was made for you and I that pleased him. Now that we have received him, now that we can have his presence in our life, let's serve him and honor him that pleases him and glorifies him. I'm not talking about gaining brownie points or more stars in your crown. I'm not talking about that, whether that happens or not. I'm talking about serve him each day, that whatever you say and whatever you do pleases him, that the influence of what we are doing and behaving is an influence of his character and of his power, that others will see and recognize that and find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God is gracious, kind, and merciful. He's not willing that any should perish, but find repentance and life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Anyone need prayer today? You have a particular need you'd like the church pray with you about?